What's up, everybody? Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Uh, welcome to what I'm going to call the 20 albums that changed my life. Seeing lots of videos floating around YouTube lately of people talking about, oh, the 10 Game Changer albums and 10 albums that changed my life and 10 albums I take to a desert island disc and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And then I was thinking, it's like, well, I, I don't know. Three years ago or so, I did a video, my favorite 30 albums of all time, which I thought would be, I would probably never need to do another thing like that. But, you know, there's a difference between 30 favorite albums of all time and albums that changed your life, right? Because there could be albums that changed your life, but they don't necessarily have to be your favorite albums of all time. Some of them might be. So I thought about it some more and thought about it some more. It's like, well, a lot of times when I do these type of lists, I don't include live albums. I don't include compilations, right? But what if I just took a look at everything, at all the albums that greatly affected me? And I have lots of favorites. But like, what about the ones that really, really impacted me and drove me to make musical decisions going forward or got me into a, uh, a new style or genre of music? And there was no looking back after that. So I really gave this some thought and I said, all right, let me see if I could put a list together. And I was going to do 10 originally. And then I was like, God, 10 is like nothing, right, when you really think about it. So I said, all right, I'll open it up to 20. I had issues with 22, but I kept it at 20. And I really tried to pick albums that were game changers for me and changed my life and changed my musical direction and opened up my eyes to new types of music. That's kind of what I was going for here. And again, there's, you, there's probably lots of other albums that you guys know that I love that aren't going to be on this list. doesn't mean I love them any less. They just may not have been game changers. They may not have changed my life. They may have, you know, turned me on to an artist or a band that I just love with every ounce of me going forward. Yeah, but I tried to pick albums that really made a huge impact on me going forward. And there'll be lots of reasons, and they're in somewhat of an order, sort of, but not. The top of the list really is. Uh, the bottom half are just kind of, they're just there, right? But they're all really important for lots of reasons. So, And I have a little story to tell with each one of them. So let's get started. So uh, at number 20, all right, so this, this is kind of a weird one because I think the genesis, no, not the band, the genesis of this one came from another kind of compilation slash live album so when i was a young kid i don't know 12 years old maybe maybe 13 i don't know i don't remember i happened to see on tv the woodstock film and that blew my mind just blew my mind that there was this kind of like mythical epic proportion rock festival like an hour from where I lived and somehow I wasn't a part of it right but meanwhile I was three years old at the time right so but in that concert film were all these fantastic performances by Santana and 10 years after and Richie Havens and the who and the list goes on and on but you know which one just thrilled me the most Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner I went and got the soundtrack to that. I drove my parents crazy playing the Star Stangle Banner. But to my mother especially, was like, oh my God, that is just noise. Why is someone desecrating the, you know, the Nash of the Star Spangled Banner and doing all this weird noisy type things? To me, I couldn't get enough of it. So lo and behold, back in uh, the early 90s, and then I bought it again when they re-released it in 2000, they came out with the full performance of Jimmy at Woodstock. So Jimi Hendrix Live at Woodstock is basically what I'm going to go with at number 20 because, you know, the soundtrack, the Woodstock soundtrack and the film just didn't have enough of the performance. I wanted it all. So when I finally got it all, it just kind of like made me appreciate all those thoughts and all that love I had for that little, little bit of this set from Jimmy at Woodstock right, that I love so much, and now all of a sudden I got Isabella, and I've got uh, Foxy Lady, and I've got, you know, the Spanish Castle Magic, and Hear My Train of Coming, and the full Woodstock improvisation and Villanova Junction, and, you know, Star Spangled Banner, Voodoo Child, Fire, the whole kit, Caboodle, Purple Haze, everything, all the guitar solos, all the jam, and yeah, some of it's sloppy as hell, but who cares? 
it's just amazing and to this day it remains my favorite live Jimi hendrix performance so yeah live at woodstock it's number 20. number 19. so this was not my first foray into this style of music but it was one that opened my eyes up to a artist a performer a musician uh, and I think really turned me on to jazz music in general. And that was uh, Miles Davis' Bitches Brew. So I had already been listening to some fusion by this point. So this was probably like when I first got into this, this was probably like 85, maybe 86, something like that. And uh, like I said, I was already listening to a little bit of fusion, more on that in a little bit. But um, I had heard so much about miles davis specifically from some of the cats who played with him that i was already kind of listening to and someone has said suggested to me well you need to listen to bitches brew and again i'm a metalhead at the time right you know i'm a college kid i'm like oh i'm listening to his metal and hard rock and uh you know little bits of this and that but for the most part that was it and i remember putting this thing on buying this and thinking holy moly like i've never heard anything like this before it's groovy, it's tribal, it's just kind of like undulating music, and uh, you got this violent guitar work from John McLaughlin, and you got Miles's like the trumpet thing, and you know, the, the drumming is off the charts, and the electric piano, and it just sounded so like, kind of like African, and out in the Congo, and just, no, not the Congo, but you know, the out, and you know, just had this feel to it. And I just loved it. And, you know, it's just really cool mood music and something really different. I remember at the time trying to turn my girlfriend onto this kind of stuff. And she's like, yeah, that's kind of weird. And I'm like, yeah, but it's great, isn't it? And I've loved Miles Davis ever since. I love the fusion stuff. I love this kind of stuff. You know, I love the funky stuff. I love the, the early stuff, the more straight ahead jazz stuff, uh, the pop stuff. Love it all. Uh, just an amazing musician and really an amazing album. And it's not, it's not my favorite Miles Davis album. But it's, to me, the one that really changed the game for me and really, really opened my eyes up to what jazz and fusion could be, right, uh, other than the stuff I was already kind of listening to. And then, you know, my Miles Davis collection has expanded in a big way ever since. All right, number 18. So this is an example of one of those albums that uh, showed that you could listen to every single track from start to finish, track one to track, whatever it is, eight over and over and over again and not get tired of it you could hear it on the radio over and over and over again not get tired of it i knew i i could in my head every solo every riff every vocal line every chorus uh just listen to this over and over and over again and it also showed to me that albums could rock hard and still be catchy as all hell and melodic and memorable and that's the first boston album yeah i mean i wore it, my lp out to death i played it non-stop I was hearing it on the radio, it wasn't enough. I was hearing it in my stereo, it wasn't enough. I made a cassette tape of it, brought it. I, I listened to this constantly. I still love to listen to this. And it just, it really opened my eyes up to, you know, harder rock and music because I was listening to another band pretty exclusively at the time. We'll get to them later. Uh, but this was something different. This was pristine musical production, top notch instrumentation, fun party rocking songs, right? And, and the album cover. And I just stare at this over and over and over again. So, yeah, Boston, self-titled, number 18. Number 17. So, throughout a good chunk of the 90s, so, again, I was a big rock and hard rock and metal guy from, like, the late 70s all the way through till about, like, maybe 1990, 91. And I, you know, the musical landscape was changing. You know, you got the Seattle scene coming in and... Uh, alternative music and hip hop and rap and you know dance music and all that kind of stuff and I I got a little bit of burnout on the heavy scene and uh, I got heavily into prog rock classic prog rock and then new at the time in the early 90s and jazz and jazz fusion and I really didn't listen to a ton of metal during the 90s I just kind of got fed up with the whole metal scene so I just kind of checked out for a while and it wasn't until like the late 90s, early 2000s that I started to get the bug to get back into metal again. And I started to listen to extreme metal. Extreme metal really was the gateway to get me back into metal again in the start of the 2000s. And there was one band in particular that um, basically allowed me to accept, uh, you know, like 
death metal and death metal vocals, even though I was listening to early death metal in the late 80s. I was listening to Death and Morbid Angel and Possessed and stuff like that. But I, you know, I kind of got away from that. And I think the band that got me back into it and the album that got me back into it was Old Pet's Blackwater Park, which really was a no-brainer for me because I was already so into prog and prog metal. And so everybody was telling me, well, Pete, this is the band you need to listen to. This is the band you need to listen to. And I gave Blackwater Park a try, and I was kind of like, all right, I need to adjust back to these type, this type of vocal style. But man, the music is totally what I love. And this led me to like Borknagar and all sorts of other, you know, black metal bands and death metal bands, both progressive and straightforward. And then I listened to God, almost exclusively extreme metal for a good chunk of the early mid 2000s um, just totally got into the scene big time and it's all due to this album and you know it, it started a love affair with Opeth that continues to this day I've kind of followed them throughout no matter what they're doing I'm in like Flynn so yeah number 17 Opeth Blackwater Park number 16 so this is an example of uh, when you're a young kid during the vinyl era which was a long time right where an album can just, to a double album can just pull you in and you can just sit and look at that gay fold and the sleeve and all the information given and just let the music kind of waft through the ears and through the brain while you're holding that album and just like marveling it. And I did this constantly with this album and that was uh, Electric Light Orchestra, otherwise known as ELO, Out of the Blue. So this is one of those albums that, uh, you know, Dad took me to J&R Music in New York City, right down the street from where he worked, over by City Hall. Um, and I picked this out, going through the racks, just because of the cover. I saw this, and I was like, holy cow, that's awesome. I think it was like six ninety nine the double album, if I remember correctly, maybe seven ninety nine. I think I had a little bit of money on me. Maybe Dad helped me a little bit, I don't remember. But I thought that this, you know, like as a kid I love like comic books and sci fi and fantasy and all that kind of stuff. So I saw this cover, I was like, I gotta get it. I gotta get it. And I brought it home in that big gatefold, right, with the uh, and again the C D has it here. It's much smaller, but you know, at least I think it does. Yeah. You got this. And then you have all this wonderful information about who plays who plays what you know specifically all this stuff and you know Jeff goes into all the keyboards that Richard Tandy played all the different kind of guitars that he played the the orchestral information all that kind of stuff and I was like wow this is fascinating reading along to the lyrics and just and I I love the album I love the songs and it just it started a love affair with ELO that has lasted you know my whole life even though there were time periods where I really wasn't listening to a lot of other music like this I always still love this album and all their albums I went after this got face the music and all, all the other records and I just you know just love ELO and specifically this album and again I remember playing this around the house and my father was a real big Beatles fan and he always kind of liked when I was playing this as opposed to another band we're going to talk about in a little bit so yeah ELO out of the blue number 16 number 15 so it's not my favorite album by this band. Well, you know, it, it, it's my favorite live album from this band, but it was it's not the album I normally talk about when I talk about my favorite albums of all time and I bring this band up. Um, it's the first album I ever got from them. It led me to another studio album and then another studio album and another studio album before I eventually bought the studio album that I generally state is my favorite album from them. But yeah, it's Unleashed in the East by Judas Priest. You talk about one of those albums where it's a live record. It's also kind of like a greatest hits live at that point in time. And the performances are just so amazing. And it's like, you know, it's funny. I think I hear in my mind, I know this album so well that when I listen to it, I hear, or even when I listen to other live recordings from this era of the same songs, what I'm hearing in my head and waiting for are those little crowd noises in between verses and songs. The little things that Hal Rob Halford would say in certain parts of the songs. The way the guitar solos are played. Oh, that riff sounds a little bit different. It's not like the Unleashed in the East riff. And, and some of my favorite versions, if not the definitive versions of a lot of these songs on here, are from this album. It's one of the great albums of this era, and uh, I, I still to this day can listen to this start to finish and think, man, that's a banger of a live album. Just so good. So yeah. 
Judas Priest Unleashed in the East. And again, one of those early 80s real heavy bands that I started getting into that kind of moved me away from another band, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, uh, into stuff like this. And there was really no looking back at that point. So yeah, Unleashed in the East by Judas Priest, number, 15, number 14. This is my first purchase from this band. And it, what's funny is uh, it started my very early prog journey, but I didn't fully dive into prog until probably a decade later. But this was the first, maybe the first, eh, maybe the second prog album I ever bought. And again, I took a chance on this. How many times did I do this when I was growing up? I saw this album cover in the, in the uh, record bins, in Record World, in Middletown, New York. And I'm a sucker for a live shot on an album cover. And this just looked amazing. And I'm thinking, I don't know who this band is, but this looks really cool. I'm going to take a chance on it. And it's Genesis Seconds Out. Amazing. Amazing stuff. And, you know, my first exposure to a lot of these classic songs was on this album. Specifically like the Peter Gabriel classics. So Supper's Ready, the first time I fell in love with Supper's Ready was on this album. First time I fell in love with, uh, you know, Firth of Fifth was on this album. First time I fell in love with uh, Little Bits of the Musical Box and The Lamb was on this album. Uh, and I just fell in love with it, and I had to start buying other stuff. And then, you know, when I bought this shortly after um, Duke had come out, so I went and got Duke. And then I went and bought a uh, kind of like a double album that had the first two, well, had um, Nursery Crimes and Foxtrot on it. And then I just started buying all sorts of other stuff I got. And then there were three and whatnot, and I didn't really... And I, I still like Genesis, but I didn't, like, really, really get into Genesis fully, like 100%, and get all the, you know, Trespass and... Uh, Wind and Wuthering and, and all that. I didn't get all those until the very early 90s, but I was just totally in love with this album. And, I, and really, this is probably like the first true British prog album that I ever bought. And I really loved it a lot. Like I said, I was still more listening to hard rock and metal, but I still had a love affair with this stuff that then carried over when I dove into prog fully big time in like 1991 or so. So yeah. Uh, number 14, that's Genesis Seconds Out. Number 13. So talk about buying an album based on seeing a cover. And actually I saw a uh, an ad for this album in, I don't know, Hit Parader Magazine, Cream Magazine. I don't remember one of those. A circus Magazine. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool looking. And then I saw it in the record store and I had to buy it. Iron Maiden Killers. Yeah, this is a complete game changer because I think this was the really first time that I took a chance on a brand new band that I really knew nothing about, you know, because a lot of these other bands, they were already around, right, even though I may not have been that familiar with them, they were not new bands. This was something brand new, this was something that I got turned on to by seeing it in a magazine, and then when I put this on... It just opened my ears up to this whole new wave of British heavy metal thing and all these other bands that I would soon discover shortly thereafter because of this. And it, it also really cemented for me just how much I love these British heavy bands. You know, I was already listening to Purple. I was already listening to Priest. I was just getting into right around the same time. I was already listening to Purple and Sabbath, right? But now all of a sudden, you know, it opened my eyes up to Saxon and Def Leppard and, and all these other bands and... You know, I still have a special place in my heart for this album. It may not be my favorite Maiden album. You know, I think Peace of Mind still kind of sits there, although that's teeter-tottering because, man, Power Slave is rising up for me. Um, but, you know, then this will always be one of my favorites. But then, you know, before you knew it, Number of the Beast came out and just all these great Maiden albums. And uh, the whole twin guitar thing, the, the bass, you know, really up front in the mix and these just kind of really intricate fast-paced snarling metal tracks man just love it and again solidified my love for great album cover art specifically like heavy metal album covers that had that like wow impact so yeah iron maiden killers number 13 all right number 12 this may come as a surprise to folks but uh i'm gonna go with meatloaf bad out of hell this was an album my cousins turned me on to. We went to go visit them in Long Island one weekend, and they were playing this, and they're like, Pete, you got to hear this new album by this guy named Meatloaf and his band. And I was like, whoa, this is pretty good. So, of course, I went out and bought it. And uh, this is probably the first album that I can think of where I literally sat down to the lyrics and, mesmer and memorized 
and was mesmerized while I was doing it, uh, memorized like every single line to every single song. I knew all of these songs backwards and forwards. I could, I can't tell you how many times I sat and just sang along to this album. You know, it's one of those albums that I've heard so many times in my life. I don't really need to listen to this all that much anymore, but I still can appreciate how important it was as a young kid of 11 years old to just kind of dive into something that wasn't another band that I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes uh, and just get carried away by the theatricality of it all. And I think it also kind of helped me really appreciate these bands that went for this more kind of vocal approach, this whole storytelling thing and this like kind of theater type atmosphere, this big bombastic type thing. Because, you know, shortly thereafter, I'm getting into Kansas and lots of other bands are doing this thing. And nowadays I can listen to so many bands, you know, like Cats in Space and other 70s bands like Supertramp and all these other bands that go for these kind of like big vocal crescendos and melodies and harmonies and things like that. And 10CC and Queen for sure, right? Uh, I think that Meatloaf helped me to kind of open my eyes up to stuff like this in a big way. So yeah, that's number 12. Number 11. Uh, I think at the time when I got this, it became one of my favorite live albums at the time. And now all these years later, it's still one of my favorite live albums. And this was kind of special because, you know, growing up, my dad was into music a little bit but very limited what he liked and what he listened to and my you know when I was growing up my dad was a big Beatles fan and he didn't really like some of the bands I was listening to all that much but when I went with him again he took me to J&R Music World in New York City and uh, when I came home with uh, Wings Over America and we started listening to this and he found out that you know this was the band run by Paul McCartney starring Paul McCartney, all of a sudden there was that connection with Dad. And Dad all of a sudden said, oh, my son finally bought an album that I think I can relate to a little bit because my father's favorite Beatle was Paul McCartney. So now all of a sudden Dad and I are listening to this album together, listening to Band on the Run together, we're listening to Speed of Sound together because I went and scooped up all of these albums, you know, Venus and Mars, I scooped up all of them like within a short time after I got this one first. Um, and I remember listening to this over and over and over again. And it even prompted me to, it was probably like 1978 or 79 or something like that. Uh, Dad and I were in a conversation one day and I was like, and I was always talking about how much I love Paul McCartney's bass lines and bass playing. And he one day asked me, he goes, would you ever be interested in playing a bass? And I was like, oh, I, th- I would love to learn, right? So and my mom went out and bought me like a cheap little cheap little bass and a little amp uh, right around that time. And for a, for a, a year or so, I attempted to uh, to try and learn bass and whatnot. I very quickly moved on to guitar, though, and never looked back on the bass thing. But I just remember lots of times just sitting down with Dad and me listening to this record and him, you know, kind of getting into it because he's like, oh, this kind of, you know, reminds me of some Beatles stuff. And there are some Beatles tunes on here and whatnot. So I'll always have fond memories of this album, but I still listen to this today. I still love it. And I still, I mean, look at that. Look at that. A little bit of glory, right? So, very cool stuff. So, Wings Over America, number 11. Number 10. So, I mentioned at the top of the show that we could, you know, I'm including studio albums, live albums, and even kind of like compilations here. Well, how about like a compilation, sort of like a soundtrack? Basically, it is a soundtrack. The Kids Are All Right by The Who. So, I happened to stumble upon the film of this, the documentary, and I had never listened to The Who before, and I was like, wow, this is... This is pretty great. I really like some of this stuff. And uh, it, it, it also spawned a love affair of music documentaries and biographies, autobiographies, because basically the kids are all right. It's the story of the Who up to that point in time and loving all the live footage, loving all the TV show appearances, loving all the interviews and all that kind of thing, the studio stuff. And I was like, wow, this is great. And I went right out and bought this. And I listened to this nonstop for like a year straight. Uh, knew it backwards and forward always had my favorite stuff from here again all of a sudden I'm like oh there's stuff from Woodstock on here awesome because I always was already into the Woodstock film already into the Hendrix stuff so right so right there I was like there's a connection here love the stuff taped at Shepard and Studios right the two tracks won't get fooled again and Bob O'Reilly all the really early stuff and man I just and I would pour over the uh, the booklet and the, the, the gatefold and just all this 
very cool stuff about all the songs and where they came from and the performances. And I was just like, wow, what a fascinating band. And it started my love affair with The Who way back then. So, yeah, kids are all right. Number nine, going to go with uh, Rush Moving Pictures. Again, one of those bands. And again, this on most days is still my favorite Rush album, although it's constantly it constantly has hemispheres and permanent waves uh, nipping at its at, at the at the bud down there trying to overtake it right um, and farewell to kings i mean all those albums i love so much but i was already i was already a rush fan at the time you know i had all the world's a stage i had uh, those other albums i just mentioned i had 2112 and i really liked them a lot but it was this album that made me like a regular rush listener like i just i remember i saw the tour Bought the album, just had the shirt, listened to this all the time. And again, it's it, this is kind of like the evolution of Rush. And they had me a light. Loved everything I did before, but now it was kind of like, all right, this is catchier, a little shorter songs. It's still pretty heavy. It's still it's kind of proggy. I wasn't really much of a prog guy at the time, just a little bit. Uh, and I love the production of it. And even though, like, for even Tom Sawyer to me, I could I could listen to Tom Sawyer, but the rest of the album still I can I really really still love to this day, and uh, you know another example of an album that I just could not put down for a long time, just played over and over and over and over again, and uh, it just made me I was already a fan of the band, it made me even more of a fan of the band, and totally kind of opened my eyes up to this whole it can still be heavy yet very kind of adventurous and somewhat technical and busy and all that sort of thing. And I just uh, love them for it. And this album still remains very special to me. So yeah, Moving Pictures by Rush. All right, number eight. So I've told this story before. Uh, in 1984, late 1984, <clears throat> I was back from a little weekend break from college and one of my buddies was like, hey, they opened up a heavy metal rock and roll record shop in Warwick, New York. You want to go this weekend since you're home? I'm like, yeah. Got a couple bucks on me, right? So we go driving down to Warwick, New York from Goshen, New York. And uh, the place was called Rock and Roll Heaven North. And at the time, I didn't know anything about Rock and Roll Heaven in New Jersey, right? Until we walked in. And we walk in. And there's, they just opened, they've been open a couple months, I think. And there's John and Marsha Zazula, Johnny Z and Marsha from Megaforce Records are in there. There's a bunch of other metalheads in there, right? And over the stereo, when we walk in, I'm hearing this. And I'm like, what is this? I love this. It was the brand new Metallica, Ride the Lightning. And I remember I had been introduced to the to the uh, Kill 'Em All album that last year, and I kind of liked it, but did but I was like, oh, this is kind of different. It's really fast. It's really frantic. I'm not really sure. I'm 100 percent into this. I like the guitar solos, a lot of cool riffs, but I just I didn't really dive any further till I heard this. And of course, I bought this that day and brought it home with me. And this basically really really opened my eyes up to much heavier music. So I was already into all, you know, I was listening to Scorpions and Maiden and Priest and Sabbath and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but this was the first time I really bought anything that was like, well, so now we call it thrash, right? But at the time, I was like, whoa. Um, I wasn't listening to, to Venom. I wasn't listening to Slayer yet. I was, I, listened, I was listening to a little bit of Motorhead, right? But this was something totally different. And really, going forward after this, and it, even further with Master of Puppets and, and uh, Justice for All... Uh, Metallica became my favorite band of the, of the 80s, of the, the mid-late 80s. <clears throat> you know, Sabbath were my favorite band, but it was Metallica who overtook Sabbath as my favorite band. I saw them on tour a ton between, like, 1984, 85 through, like, 1991. Saw Metallica so many times, opening, 
headlining everything. And man, I just couldn't get enough Metallica. And then all from here, I, you know, Anthrax and Megadeth and Overkill and Testament of Slayer and you name it, all these other bands uh, just open, you know, started listening to Possessed, I started listening to Venom, I started listening to, you know, before you know, you got Death coming around the corner and all that other more extreme stuff, Celtic Frost, Merciful Fate. It opened my eyes to everything else. So I really owe it all to Metallica to get me into this more extreme brand of heavy metal. Nowadays, you look back on it, it's not all that extreme at all, right? But back then, it kind of was. So yeah, that's uh, my number eight, Ride the Lightning. Number seven, we're going to go with my first ever Fusion album. So I think I've told this story too. Uh, when I was in school in uh, SUNY New Paltz in college, I believe it was 1985, uh, I was living off campus in an apartment, and uh, I had a, a good friend of mine who lived next door to me. He was a deadhead. And uh, one day, it was in the middle of the afternoon, and I, I didn't have any classes. I guess he didn't either. And he comes knocking at my door. He goes, hey, you home? What are you doing? I'm like, ah, I'm just hanging around. And he's like, ah. He goes, I'm just chilling out next door, you know, getting a little stoned and uh, listening to some Mahavishnu Orchestra. You want to come check it out? And I'm like, Maho who 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 who? He's like Mahavishnu Orchestra, John McLaughlin. You never listened to John McLaughlin before? I'm like, no. It's like I heard the name, but I never listened to him before. You know, again, me, Pete the Metalhead, right? So I go next door with him, sit down, we get comfy, starts it back at track one, and I'm kinda like, Wow, what is this thing we're listening to? This ain't no Ingve Momstein. <laughs> this ain't no Jimi Hendrix. What is this crazy ass kind of jazzy, freaky music here? And he's like, ah, this, I guess you call this fusion, right? It's kind of jazz. McLaughlin used to play with Miles Davis. I'm like, well, I, I heard of Miles Davis. And we're going through Meeting of the Spirits, Dawn, Vital Transformation, The Lotus on Irish Dreams. I mean, Dance of Maya. I'm just kind of like, holy cow. And the more my mind is getting kind of fluttery, the more the music is taking me away. And I'm like, wow. And you know what I went out and got shortly thereafter, right? Was this, and then Birds of Fire. And from there, I went on to get Romantic Warrior by Return to Forever and the host of other fusion bands. And that just opened my ears up and my eyes and my heart up to stuff that um, was way beyond what I was listening to. And instrumental music really became, you know, I, I fell in love with the Dixie Dregs and the Steve Morse band shortly thereafter. And yeah, there was kind of no turning back. No turning back from that. I started listening more to uh, to Frank Zappa, and uh, so yeah, I owe it to the Mahavishnu Orchestra, and my good buddy Dave, who turned me on to uh, this album, and then a world of other stuff afterwards. So yeah, that's number seven for me. Number six, probably the first, eh, maybe not the first instance, but an instance, another one, yeah, maybe the first instance of where an album just completely took over my life. And it lasted for like decades, decades. Um, I was already listening to this band, and I really liked them a lot. And I liked the band a lot that the singer was with before he formed this band. But when this came out, I, I can't remember, other than maybe my number one on this list, I can't remember another album in my life that just completely swept me away for a long period of time. And that's White Snake's 1987 self-titled album. Up until recently, this was still my white, favorite White Snake album. It's been overtaken by Sliding In. And again, that just could be so many years of listening to this and loving this, right? Um, and then Sliding In just kind of rising above. But man, just I was just obsessed with this album. Obsessed with it. And all through the 80s, all through the 90s, most of the 2000s, I just I listen to this regularly. Uh, I just love Coverdale's vocals on here. Love Sykes's guitars. It's big. It's thunderous. It's heavy. It's sleazy. It's bluesy. It's just you know, you can keep is this love. I never need to hear that song ever again. In fact, I wish you, know, you could just snip that out of the album. But um, the rest of it, man, ugh. you know, and I've heard here here I go again. 
way too many times. I think that's my issue with this album now. It's so overplayed in my in my mind that like I I've allowed another album to overtake it, even though I always that other album is always my number two. But yeah, but man, crying in the rain, still of the night. I still love still of the night. We, I did a whole music video on it uh, in college in uh, TV production class. Children of the night, straight through all. Don't turn away. The whole thing is just great. Bad boys, so good. Love the production of it. Yeah, it was a game changer for me. Changed my life for decades. You know. Even all the people who are like, oh, that's your favorite album of all time? Jesus, Whitesnake. Ah, bleh. Yeah, it is. It was. All right, my number five. So probably the first instance of Pete latching onto a guitar hero. There have been a lot of other guitar heroes, you know, for those of you waiting for me to talk about an album with Michael Schenker or Gary Moore or whatnot. Yeah, love them all to death, but there was there was a first guy before all of them, and you can't fit everybody on this list, right? But the guy who, you know, really made me say, wow, I dig that a lot. I would love to start playing guitar and maybe do stuff like that. Robin Trower, live. Again, I had never, I had no idea who Robin Trower was when I saw this album in the CD rack. C rack in the uh, LP rack in Record World in Middletown, New York. I saw this great live shot. I looked at the back and I was like, "Ooh, I don't know who this Robin Trower guy is, but it's a power trio. It's only three guys. I'm gonna check it out." He's playing a Stratocaster like Jimmy. He's playing in front of a huge stage, the huge audience there. It's got to be good. And I brought it home, and I was like, "Oh, this is bluesy." It's kind of psychedelic. It's kind of heavy, sort of, maybe not. But man, the guitar playing. And that voice, Jimmy Dewar. And that is this album that really, really led me on a lifelong love affair with guitar-oriented music. Guitar-dominated music. And uh, and I've loved Robin Trower to this day. But it was this album that got me started to really appreciate guys like Frank Marino and Ted Nugent and and Michael Schenker and Gary Moore and Uli John Roth and all all these guys, Richie Blackmore, all of them. Uh, This, Robin Trower is the guy, and this album is the guy who really made me just always be focusing on the guitar and really wanting to play guitar. So yeah, Robin Trower live, number five. Number four, speaking of Richie Blackmore, let's... Cut to the chase. Made in Japan. Complete game changer for me. Yeah, In Rock is my favorite Deep Purple album. I love Machine Head, love Fireball, love Burn. You know, I love all the Deep Purple albums. But the one that, uh, and it's funny, this was not the first Deep Purple purchase I made. That was actually that Deepest Purple compilation. That is what turned me on to Deep Purple. But it, this was the album. I bought this shortly thereafter where I was like, that's great. And then all of a sudden I buy this album and there are longer versions of some of those songs with lots of jamming and, and, and just crazy guitar solos and Ian Gillen howling and John Lord rampaging around. And I was like, and I played this double album to death, start to finish. I would sit in front of my little stereo down in my room in the basement. I would have one speaker on each side. I'd be sitting there with the gatefold right in the middle. And I'd just be like... Just rocking back and forth, getting into this playing air guitar, playing air organ, singing along to Ian. Um, Yeah. Still love this live album. I know for some people it's too much jamming. Nah, not for me. Awesome stuff. Deep Purple made in Japan, and it started a lifelong love affair with this band who have either been number one, two, or three of my favorite bands of all time for, you know, 40 plus years, 45 years close to. Right? So, yeah, made in Japan. Number four, number three, Images and Words by Dream Theater. It's not my very favorite Dream Theater album, but this, in the early 90s, got me to thinking that there is a world of progressive music, because I was really getting heavy into prog at the time, of progressive music that's still heavy, it's still kind of metal, but it can have catchy hooks and really intricate arrangements and still be heavy. And I fell in love with this band. I've seen Dream Theater now more than any other band ever. 20 some odd times over the years. I mean, I went for many, many years. I've saw them on every single tour 
and sometimes multiple times on a tour, which was a really cool thing to do because they used to play like a different set list every single night. Um, they don't really do that anymore, but still, I love going to see them as much as I possibly can. But yeah, this, you know, some classic tracks on here. I just loved how catchy it all was, but it was still fairly heavy, and it was really, really complex and technical in spots. It was just kind of like a little bit of everything that I loved, and it started me, you know, and it was my kind of gateway into other bands that would come shortly thereafter doing this sort of thing. You know, you had Symphony X and Van den Plaas and all these other bands that kind of did this prog metal thing. Uh, and it made me, it shed new light for me on bands like Fate's Warning, who I was listening to in the 80s and Queensryche and all that, right? So, uh, yeah, just a game changer for me. It can be prog and it can be heavy too at the same time. Love it to death. All right, number two. Well, really, the first band I ever latched onto, the first heavy band I ever latched onto, and uh, my world from 1976 till about 1979 was all about this band. I had other bands I really liked a lot. You know, I talked about Wings. I was listening to ELO. I liked uh, Sticks and Kansas, and I was listening to a little bit of Yes and Genesis and uh, Steve Miller Band and, you know, the Eagles and whatnot, but... It was all about Kiss for me, and Kiss Alive was the album. Uh, I liked the studio albums a lot, too. I had them all, bought them all, still have them all, uh, but the one I always go back to then, and I always go back to now, is this double live album. It's got all the definitive versions of all these great songs, and it just still sounds fresh to me today. I can still listen to this today. If, if this episode turned into a you know, Desert Island, top 10 Desert Island discs, the 10 albums you would take, if you could only take 10, I would still take this, because I could still listen to this and really enjoy it today. Even though Kiss isn't nearly one of my favorite bands anymore, I still really love this album a lot, and this was a complete game changer for me. This was the album that made me understand that deep down inside, I really liked heavy music a lot. I liked the danger of it all. I liked the rawness of it all. I loved the, the guitars, right, and the energy. This was it. This was it. So that's number two. Can anybody guess what number one is? It should be pretty obvious if you've been following me for a while. Yeah, it's Paranoid. Number one, the album that changed my life above all. I still remember the day like it was like it happened yesterday. Going over to another friend, Dave. I've known a lot of Daves in my life. Uh, after school one day. And he's like, oh, check out this album that I picked up at a, I think he got it at a flea market or something like that. He got the old Nems version of it. And uh, I was like, Black Sabbath. I don't know who the hell they are, right? This was probably, God, 1978, maybe something like that. And uh, he played it. And I loved it. Because I was already a Kiss fan, right? But this was something different. This was darker. This was menacing. And man, those riffs of that guy, what's his name? Tony Iomi? Tony Iomi? Holy moly. And songs like Iron Man. And back then, Paranoid, when I still could listen to Paranoid. Now, I have a hard time with Paranoid now. But man, War Pigs and all, everything is on here. You know, Planet Caravan, weird as it was, Electric Funeral, Hand of Doom, Fairies Wear Boots. I was like, and I remember especially Iron Man, like just kind of was like, whoa, holy cow. You know, before the song like Iron Man got kind of played out for everybody. Uh, I fell in love with this. And I tell you, within a span of a, a week or two, I convinced him to trade this album for something else. I couldn't tell you what I traded for it. But I know I was going to do anything in my power to get that out of his hands and get it into mine full time. And this became the soundtrack to my life. The band in general, for the next... Until probably about 85. I still loved Sabbath in the 80s. But until Metallica took over the reins for me, uh, I was a Sabbath guy with everything in me. I listened to, you know, I listened to Zeppelin, I listened to all the other bands, right? But this was the band that I truly felt like that that feeling. Like that I was part of something. And uh, you know, to my disappointment shortly there not that long afterwards you know trying to say you know i'm scooping up other sabbath albums left and right i went and bought the debut i went and got master reality and volume four and sabbath buddy sabbath blah 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 and then i'm waiting for a new sabbath and then like you know heaven and hell comes out and i go and buy that and i'm looking at the back i'm like that doesn't look like ozzy and i put it on i'm like that certainly isn't ozzy 
what happened to Ozzy? Before you know it, it's the word is out that Ozzy has been out of Sabbath for a while. No internet back then. And he's got his own band. That comes out soon enough, right? We get Blizzard of Oz, and that was another one, right? Um, but yeah, this, this album did it for me. And again, to this day, it's not my favorite Sabbath album. I have others that I like more. It, you know, is it a great Sabbath album? Yeah, it's legendary. It's up there. It's not a top five easily, top five, six, whatever. But, um, but this did it. This was my game changer right here. Above all, the one album that completely changed my life, my focus in life, was Paranoid by Black Sabbath. So there you have it, everybody. My The 20 albums that changed my life, 45 minutes worth of Pete uh, once again talking about these albums that mean so much to him. And I hope you like the stories because I think this is more about the stories than just about the albums themselves. We all know these albums, right? But how they affected us and how they kind of helped shape our lives, our musical lives, and even, you know, our lives in general, I think is always fun to talk about. So uh, let us know what your Game Changer albums, the albums that changed your life, your lives, whether you want to do a top 10 or top 20, play along, do it in the comments below, and uh, we'll see you soon. Whoever more stuff, I'm Pete Barra. Thanks for watching. Visit us on the web at www.cdtranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, all together, all the damn time. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and click on that notification bell so you get alerted of all of our content as it posts, and please do hit the like button before you leave. Also, down below, we get the links to our Ko-Fi page for channel donations, our merch page, and our Cameo page. Thank you in advance for all your support. They've got a lot of Cameo requests lately, so, so that's always fun, right? It's doing all these little videos and answering questions and birthday wishes and all that kind of stuff. Loads of fun. So uh, keep them coming. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you soon. I am Pete Bardo. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.